And welcome to the show. And uh, we uh, we're back here with Mary Will and Mason. And Mary, it's great to have you here. You're the author of this book here, The Hevernaut, right? Yes, indeed. Which is the story of Ma- Marie Anne La Gemonnière, yes. right? Yes. And I know we had we had John before, and we talked about the book. Yeah. But um, but we got you back, and uh, I just want to maybe start by getting what inspired you because you're from Toronto right to tell this story of this uh, this woman who was uh, a pioneer on the Canadian prairies way back when well um, I was in Valmarie Saskatchewan and that's about 30 years ago and Valmarie Saskatchewan when you I drove into it because I needed gas mm-hmm and I drove down the main street, and it looked, it looked like a movie set, a Western movie set where everybody had gone for craft, dead. Abso- I mean, it was just a village. Right. And I met a wonderful, wonderful woman who <laughs> introduced me to most of the people in Valmarie. And instead of just buying gas on a Hamburg, the, oh, boy, it was a good Hamburg, um, I, I met a woman who had discovered this recollection by the Abbe Georges de Gast of the first white woman who lived in the West. And she had, it was published in Montreal in 1883, and she translated it. You mean it was in French Lise, originally? Lise Pierrot translated yeah. the, the French book. To and English. She, yeah. in, her, in the basement of her house, she and her husband had collected stuff that they'd found when they were walking on the prairies and they called it a museum wow. and she had her, her little booklet for sale yeah. so I bought the booklet and it was all about the first white woman in the west and I was just absolutely thrilled, I mean I, I read it over and over hmm. and it was so I mean her life was so exciting and uh and this was like a, was it a diary or something that uh, uh, they just, had preserved? Just, well, it was just like an obituary, an extended obituary. Yeah. And uh, so <laughs> it, it was fun to read it. And, <sighs> event, you know, I am a writer. I don't normally write novels. I write facts. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Fact <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so anyway, I woke up, oh, I guess two or three times over a period of about six months and I was arguing with somebody and they were saying but there is a record of me but it's not really right and besides it takes a woman to write about what I went through and I said look I just don't have the time I I really don't and that but the third time I said all right (laughs) <laughs> she okay. broke you down. So this was okay. A- I have too many assignments, but but I'll I'll do my best. So um, this is what happened. So you were like uh, may, you were being contacted by uh, by Marie, I, right I, in your that's, sleep. That's the way it felt. Yes. So this is uh, so and now okay. That, I mean that's pretty fascinating, right? Do you think uh, or have you had confirmation? From uh, from Maria. No, no, I I, I think she's she's wandered off to some some other part and no. So I, she's happy. I, I hope she's satisfied. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's an uh, that's an amazing story. I hope they're selling the book oh, at yes. that museum in uh, Val. Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they are. Well, you should be contacting them and letting. Yeah, them know. I should. You're when, absolutely right. You see, I'm a writer. I'm not an entrepreneur. But when, when you yeah. say, help me to understand, when you say she was the first white woman yes. in the West, yes. what yes. does that mean? I don't understand. Who else was there? Are we talking aboriginals? We're talking the very beginning of the 19th century. So this would have been 18, around 1800. So what, or else, what, what year? who else was yes. there? She had her first baby in 1808 in a, in a buffalo hide tent. In okay. Saskatchewan? So we're and see, the, the only... How did she uh, get there? <laughs> well, the, the only white people, and they were all French or Scots, because they were uh, employees of Hudson's Bay. Yeah. And the only, those were all men because they were trappers. There was no place for a woman. And it was oh, Jean-Baptiste Lajemonnier who married her. 
then after a single week, he decided he had to go back to the West. He couldn't stand. So he married her what in Montreal or something? Um, no, in uh, Basque-Nouge. In Quebec. Yes, that's somewhere around Trois Rivières. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so then, and so then she was the first white woman to venture out there. Yes, she was. She was. So you had to be very brave to do that. Well, she was. She was just crazy about Jean Baptiste, and he was crazy about her. I mean, the, the two two people who had just absolutely fallen so far in love they they couldn't exist without each other. So off they went together, like a pair of hippies. And they probably canoed, right? They canoed out there, right? Oh yeah. That was the only way to get around back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, oh, by the way, Pierre Burton, you probably heard this quote. He, he says uh, oh, yes. a Canadian is someone who's at least tried to have sex in a canoe, right? <laughs> it's a Canadian who has had sex in a canoe oh. without tipping. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> I had a canoe once. I had, It was so tippy. I had to put... So, uh, okay, I had Hugh. to make... Uh, Outriggers for it. So, Hugh, are you Canadian? <laughs> she, she was a, yeah. I'm Canadian. Did it tip? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, you know what? That's, uh, wow. So now, now when I see that commercial, I am Canadian, it <laughs> takes on a whole other meaning for me, that Molson uh, Canadian yeah. commercial. My well, goodness. It, 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 made, it made a lot of difference to me to say I am Canadian because, I mean, you know, here's a, here's a fellow Canadian who was an absolutely wonderful woman. Yeah. And wow. she had eight babies all together. She had them all out there. Out there. Wow. Yeah. And um, she's the grandmother of Louis Riel. And Louis Riel is thought by some people to be a real leader and by some people to be a traitor. And and uh, well, and it caused a huge. The whole real um, rebellion was a huge political event that kind yeah, of the, divided. The tosh. Canada, the whole country was divided over that issue, and yes. uh, even today, echoes of it uh, remain yes. to a certain extent. Well, uh, uh, Louis Riel was a brilliant young man, and from his his female grandparents, he inherited a lot of courage and mm -hmm. just resilience and strength and um, he became he wasn't a Métis because there wasn't enough French at least in, sorry enough uh, indigenous blood in him to be called a Métis but he he was a leader of the Métis he was yeah. a great leader of well, the well they Métis. just didn't want to have they wanted their own republic right well uh, um he, you know, I think I've discovered something, because <laughs> uh, I, I realized that uh, he was a man of, of bitterness. And um, what makes a young man bitter? Mm. Well, one of the things is, is when, uh, when you come of what's considered a good family, and you're intelligent, and you've been sent far from your home to study at a college, and you fall in love with a girl who comes from a, a, a similar family in Montreal. And when the father of the girl finds out that there's even a taint of indigenous blood, uh, you can't marry. Oh, so, so it was a, he was I, tainted by this racism? or Yes. So that's considered wow. lower class? Yes. Yeah. Well, so yeah. this teaches us something about Canada and, and where we've come from and, and mm -hmm. what we're trying to do about it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very interesting. So do you touch on that in the book? Do you get to no. any of those no, issues? No, because, because uh, I was advised to, to cut it off uh, when, the fir when the priests came for the first time and they established uh, a real settlement in, uh, what, well, now uh, Winnipeg. And her husband had done such a such a wonderful thing for the Hudson's Bay Company that he'd been given an enormous tract of land, which is now known as St. Boniface. Mm. So, wow! You know, they're, they're they're wonderful Canadians. Hmm. So, are you? Uh, it sounds to me like you're very proud of this. I'm book. sorry. It sounds to me like you're very proud of this book. Well, I'm I'm proud to be part of the same country as. Marie and Lachemonier. Yeah. 
I, she, she's a terrific person. <laughs> <laughs> now, i got to ask you, though, because since you wrote the book, has, is it being translated into French? I, you know, that would be... I would so, so be pleased if someone would translate it into French so that we could say to the French, to the, to the Francos, we Anglos are just as much in awe of Marie Anne as you, as you people are. And the other thing it, uh, it it talks to me about is that uh, you know people think that the French is only in Quebec or maybe uh, a little bit no. of uh, New Brunswick, but we know that there are Francophones were the first people to see the West, and there are French Canadian communities all across the West, even in Alberta today. Right? There, uh, oh, I didn't know that. The first people who came to the entire swath. <clears throat> of the North American continent were French. Mm -hmm. You have only to look at a, at a dictionary, or I mean a... A, a map. An atlas. Yeah. <laughs> and, and look at all the French names. Um, Detroit is a good example. Yeah. That's a French word for narrow. Yeah. Well, it's narrow between oh. two of the Great Lakes. So the people who, the Coureur de Bois, the explorers, the all French, would say on the map that they were drawing, well, put, put narrows there because that's, uh, you know, that'll tell us where we are. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's now called Detroit. And so on, uh, all the way along. Uh, New Orleans, uh, St. Louis. Near, near uh, Chicago. Chicago. Uh, I had a lot of, when I lived in Chicago, I had friends who lived in Des Plaines. Mm-hmm. Or which Illinois, it, yeah, which right? just means plains, yeah, prairies. Yep. Huh. Interesting. So uh, it it must yeah. you know it must have been very difficult for the uh, for the uh, our our Franco fellow Canadians when they when they found out that that what they considered to be French really um, the President Jefferson just sold to. Or bought from North, from Napoleon. The Louisiana he Purchase. Bought the land. Yeah. And you know that they thought of it as French. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it so. was. Uh, France was having their own troubles at that time, of course. I'm sorry. France was having their own troubles yes. at the time, and they weren't really in in a situation where they could manage well, they, the colonies anymore. Napoleon right? wasn't making any money out of it, so exactly. So Plus, he, he was, sold it. <laughs> yeah. For his wars. Yeah. Which we had to fight. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big, long story. Oh, so listen, we were going to talk about what you were calling the first dinner party in Canada, yes. right? That's in the book. It's a yes. true story. Do you want yes, to just to tell book. us that story? Well, um, they set off from the uh, Fort of the Prairies, which is now Edmonton, and they went off to uh, the, just the two of them um, and their kids, not, the, <coughs> not with a band, as most people did, to fight uh, to, to trap buffalo which they needed for their food and their blankets and their tents and everything else. And um, so the two of them set off alone. And uh, Jean-Baptiste did something that, that sometimes men do and it drives women crazy. Um, <laughs> he didn't tie the horses up properly and they escaped. And so she was left out on the prairies all night long with two kids by herself. And she was terrified. She and uh, he had to find them because that was like that was it. Without a car, you just yeah. so um, he did. He he did find them eventually, but it took him the whole day. And in the morning, um, Marie Ann had these two kids, and she was trying to explain to the children that Daddy would be home soon, and you know everything's fine. And all of a sudden, she heard hoofbeats. And she saw an enormous crowd of, of uh, Sarsis on the warpath. And she'd never seen a whole tribe on the warpath. What's, a, what's a Sarsi? Just terrifying. A what is a uh, Well, it's a, it's a tribe of, of indigenous people. Okay, okay. Um, uh, most of the people were Cree. Okay. And so anyway... Um, they they just who are they on the warpath against? They were on the warpath. They were painted up and. But who are they going after? Yeah, I mean, just who were no, they going who? after, though, Mary? Huh? Who were they going after? Well, they they were hunting, but they were oh. on the warpath. I I have no idea why, but it okay. was probably because of 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 territories and hunting. That's usually what people fight about. 
Okay. And so um, she thought that, that she'd be killed, just, you know, bludgeoned to death yeah. in no time at all. Um, and in order to, to keep things going, uh, they, they, they just let her be when they found that there were no Crees in her tent, mm. as it turned out. So they were after the Crees. So, so they were after the Crees. Yeah. And so she figured, well, um, they, they, they decided, obviously, to, uh, to stay around until her husband came, until uh, the man who should have been right. with them. Right, okay, so dead. they wanted to see who was... So, uh, it, so hours went by, so she decided, well, the best thing to do was to give them something to eat, so she... She filled her big kettle and put meat in it and boiled it up all the time with with all these warriors staring at her. I mean, how she how you do that? I wonder how, how you could. And and she got the dinner, oh, the, the feast ready, and she also uh, went into her tent and she brought out the, the little bit of tobacco of of Jabotis. And she proffered that, and that was received. Wow. And she thought, well, I, you know, still I haven't killed me. Mm -hmm. And then with the dinner, and she put she put put some meat on the on the grass, and they all sat around and ate that. So she figured, well, uh, okay, <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. So now, where did you get that tidbit? Was that uh, in the diary or yes. the uh, record, the, yes. the the obituary? Yes. Okay. Yes. So she did give the first dinner party in the West wow. in rather peculiar circumstances. Now, did John, what happened when Jean Baptiste came? Uh, Sorry. What happened when Jean Baptiste came back? Uh, well, oh, that was that was very very touch uh, problematical because he couldn't understand <laughs> them either, and uh, so for a long time they they sort of fiddled around with each other, and um, the. Um, Chief, the Sarsi chief was was uh, very disdainful of Jabatis. Uh, Any man who would leave his wife or mm. um, yeah, that would tie yeah. a horse up. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> What's he doing here? Uh, yeah. And so uh, they they said that that they would have to stay with them and. Uh, that eventually they'd get back to uh, Fort of the Prairies because they had left five of their people for some reason. I don't know. It's not understood at Fort of the Prairies, so they'd have to go back with them. And um, they really all had a guilty conscience of some sort, I think, because they had uh, come across some Crees and had slaughtered them. Wow. And all Jean Baptiste's friends had mm. escaped. But their wives had not. They were friends of the yes. friends of Marie Anne. Wow. So it had been a slaughter, and they were looking for the rest of the Crees, which is when they found Marie Anne. And anyway, um, they said that sh they would have to stay with them. And so uh, Marie Anne, by this time, was almost fainting. With, and uh, this was a, a, a good help to Jean Baptiste, who said that his wife was very sick. He made the Mm -hmm. sign language and so on and that they that he would take her off mm -hmm. well off turned out to be a copse some way off mm. and as soon as they got the other side of the copse and they realized that the the sarsis were had forgotten all about them really they were just settling down um, they they took off and they rode for five days until they got to fort of the prairies and they mm. made it just mm. before the the uh, Sarsi dust was seen. Yeah, they, they just wow. escaped death. Wow! Wow! Well, it sounds, sounds like, like a, a great great history. This should be taught in classes you, in schools. You should be teaching this to young kids. Or they should just read the book in, in either an English class or in history class or or, or something. But that's well, the fun is that it's a good story. And it's Canadian history. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's part true. of history we don't know anything about. And not only that, but you actually had uh, spoke to uh, Marie-Anne Lajemonier. Sorry? In your dreams, you were speaking with uh, the principal Marie character. I guess with Marie-Anne. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, now are you doing any readings or anything? 
Uh, yes. Oh, sure. When and where? Uh, well, I haven't any on at the moment. I have done some. But I'm open. I'm open to suggestion. <laughs> you so, should think about getting these in, in schools. So I mean, that's great material for schools. It's a great well, education. There, there is a, there is a, there is a very hard thing about this. I couldn't get a Canadian publisher interested, so I self-published an American publisher. Now, I, they're mm. they're selling mildly but they're selling in the states yeah but because it's self-published somehow it's well it's as though they were as though it's illegitimate yeah and so people are turning up their or, uh, educational types turn up their noses at something that's it's well, self-published I think we have to do they're something to change something. that of course they <laughs> are well anyways it's uh, been great to have you back on and um, we're, and I guess people can go to your website and get the book? Yes. Mary? Uh, the the evernaught.ca. The evernaught.ca, and they can order the book there. And, um, and, and the, the name of the book comes from the French word for winter, because that was the word given to the French traders who, who remained in the West over the winter. Yeah. Hmm. The evernaughts. Yes. In other words, a wintering. Yeah, yeah. Well, and she we was the first winterer because I put an E on Evernal, and that makes it feminine. And, of course, the winters uh, out west are uh, a little worse even than the winters in Montreal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty Or rural. even Masque and Alger, wherever that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, Mary, thanks for again for coming in today. It's great to see you oh, again. Oh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to see you, and <laughs> pleasure to see you both. <laughs> <laughs> so we're uh, looking forward to reading the book. We're going to take a little break, come back with more right here on liquidlunch.channel.com. Yeah. I used to have. 